Father, I ask that you would take our minds, take my voice, study and words and thinking, and you would direct all of them towards you, that we might become more like you, and that this time may be productive in your service. Amen. Amen. Those who, of you who know me reasonably well, and some of you do, uh, will know that I am addicted to learning. I have this thing that every, within me that has to constantly probe and find out stuff I don't know anything about. Uh, and there's a lot of that. So I spend a lot of time reading, I spend a lot of time uh, looking at things and searching out things and following rabbit trails. Uh, I love, I love sort of starting in one place and ending up, you know, somewhere entirely different. Uh, shaking my head, saying, "Who knew?" You know. Well, I do a lot of that. Uh, I was doing that last night, uh, and, uh, and this is, and I was uh, on a TED talk, which I sometimes go to. Uh, I don't know if any of you do that sort of thing. I've got an iPad and TED Talk comes up. And there was a gal named, um, I went, I heard her name down somewhere, Jesse Christian, who was giving a very short 10 minute TED Talk. Uh, she was a New Zealander who had been fascinated with astrophysics in space uh, her whole life. And she'd aimed her all her teaching. She got her doctoral degree. She went out and she, um, joined a group that worked from, uh, she, her first job was uh, worked with the uh, James, uh, not the James Webb, but one of the major planetariums. And her job was to look for ecoplanets. Now that's, um, in today's world, that kind of means something that's a little different than her definition of that. When she started working on in 2004, uh, what she was doing was looking, an ecoplanet is a planet that is outside of our planetary system. So it has nothing to do with our ecology on this planet, but it has to do with a planet that's outside our solar system. And what her ambition in life was to find a new planet outside of our solar system. And when she started looking, there were no, sorry, there were less than a hundred planets that had been identified outside of our solar system in the entire universe. They could point to, give a number, and have some description of less than a hundred planets. So on the first day, she got to work, and they gave her all her stuff and her assignment, and she, it was her job was to go out there and start looking for planets. Uh, and she described how she did that, and I won't, I won't tell you because it's very complicated and, and it's really boring. <laughs> it sounds like it would be exciting, but it's not. And the first day she went there, and she didn't find a planet. And the first month she went there, and she did not find a planet. And she was really disappointed. In fact, she did not find a planet for the first five years uh, that she was working there. No one did. Uh, it just, they were too far out there and, and, and the tools were too. Five years later, the, J, uh, the um, Templar, sorry, the, the Templar telescope in 2009 was put out into orbit, which gave astrophysicists a whole new look at things. And from that point on, she began in the first week she found 30 planets, and there are now 5,000 known planets outside of our solar system. And I've been, part of that is since the James Webb Planetary Telescope went up this year, or in the last year, there have been some amazing things that they've discovered out there. I don't know if any of you have seen any of the pictures. So it's just, it's just mind-blowing, it's extraordinary. None of that has anything to do with what we've just talked about, except that most of us, in some ways, in our lives, will 
spend time looking big picture and then looking small picture and then looking big picture and looking small picture. <coughs> what am I going to do today? What's this year going to look like? Uh, what's for dinner? What are our finances for retirement look like? You know, what is, what is, what can, when have we not seen in the village down the road? And what could we see on a holiday in Italy this year? You know, we move back and forth on all these scales. Can I encourage you that that is the way to read this? And I notice, and this is not criticism in any way, I'm not judging anybody, but some of us pick these up when we come in here, and some of us don't. Some of us just listen. Some of us take in better listening. But when you read a passage, which you always want, whether it's in church or whether it's at home, what you really want to do to get the sense of the, the, the full sense of the passage is to drill down into the passage and look at the words. And if you were to look at this one to begin with, uh, uh, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, then you would think, ah, oh, John the Baptist has been put in prison. If you know anything about that, if you don't, you will do a little homework and you should. So that was the reason that Jesus moved from Nazareth uh, to Capernaum. So think about that. So you get into all the detail and the depth of this and, and that. But on the other hand, if you just look at the passage of today, so if you don't have this when you're in here, what you wouldn't know is the context of that. What went first? So when you look at verse 12, if you haven't been reading through, you kind of want to look, you know, you get into it and then you say, ah, oh. so you go back a few and say, where is this set in, in, in the book? Uh, so how does, this, how does this fit in with the other things that are going on? Because it is written as an entirety. And if you don't get the context, you won't get the fullness of the detail. Okay, that's just a little bit about how to work with this on Sundays and uh, and how to put the things that I'm going to say and I normally say week to week in context or other locums when they come in. For instance, what we've got here is a piece, but there are two, I'm not going to tell you anything about it, but there are two verses after our last verse. So this is 12 to 23, but there are actually 25 verses in that chapter. What do the last two verses say? They weren't read to us. But they weren't a separate paragraph or anything else. They were just attached. Are we missing out? Let's go home and find out. <laughs> <laughs> we're in, uh, in a particular time uh, of, of the year. We're in Epiphany time. And, uh, and so our liturgy has changed a little bit with this. And our, we're looking at things big picture, if you will. Uh, and, and that's quite appropriate. It's the new year. It's the time of resolutions. It's the time of looking backwards and saying, how did the last year go? And looking forward to how I hope next year and making plans. Jenny has been chasing, uh, uh, chasing me about my plans for February and when I'm going to be here, and, and and I've been dodging her for two weeks now because I haven't gotten finished. Linda and I are still working at that, so I owe you that on Monday. It's coming, Jenny. You know, it's that kind of a time where we we, we, we go in and we go out and we look big picture, uh, and the readings for Epiphany are like that. This is where some of, not all of, but some of the gospel writers are laying out the themes that will go throughout their book. They're laying out the picture and, then, and they're, they're taking this story of Jesus uh, into a whole new phase. We now 
Turn a, turn a corner, Jesus has been born, we've gone all of, all of the infancy narratives, and now we're going into big picture, what's coming? Let's look at the words, a couple of the words. Get me down, deeper. Verse 17, uh, we heard that Jesus, uh, John had been put in prison, Jesus goes to Nazareth, Sorry, it goes from Nazareth to Capernaum. Uh, it says, in order to fulfill what the prophet Isaiah said, in other words, he's trying to organize his life around what God has laid out for him. So he moves to Capernaum, and it says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven or as it's mentioned in the other Gospels, the kingdom of God. Slightly different words, same idea. Matthew is very careful not to use the word for God to a Jewish audience, because that's the, an anathema to them. They can't say it, they can't write Yahweh. So often in those days, if you were talking about God and the things associated with them, you would talk about heaven. This is not meant to be a, a place that, that we all go to later on. It is, uh, it is a euphemism uh, for God himself and the things that, that are of him. So he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? What would they have heard when they heard that? Well, firstly, repentance. <laughs> and I think most of you know this. Repentance is meant to and repentance means it is not, it's not a feeling. This is not feeling guilty. This is not feeling sorry. This is not even recognizing that you've done something wrong. Repentance has nothing to do with that. The literal translation of the word is to change direction. And the implication of it is, if you're trying to get there, and you're walking this way, you aren't going to get there. You actually have to turn around, change direction, and aim yourself in that direction. That's what John the Baptist was preaching. Change direction. And that's what Jesus is preaching. You guys, if you really want to get over there, are going to need to aim in that direction, not in this direction. Something's out of sync, and you need to readjust it. And he says, repent. This is the time to do that, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Part of what was out of sync was their mindset. They were thinking of God and his kingdom. They all weren't thinking it the same way. The Jewish people were thinking of God and his kingdom as a as a physical place where the Jewish people would rule and reign and live in safety and security. The kingdom of God that's been promised to us is going to be the place where our religious leaders are in charge and that we can worship and live free of the pressures that we now live under. And the Messiah who is coming is going to bring us to that place. And it will be a current and physical place, and then it will be an eventual place after death when it's fulfilled uh, in some fashion which they were they had different ideas about. A Gentile would have been thinking the kingdom of God would have meant very little to them because they didn't use that language, but the kingdom would have been very clear because We've, we've, got a, we've got a king, we've got a ruler, and we have lots of gods. And so pick your god, and this is the kingdom in which we worship that god and we live in that kingdom. So here's Caesar, and there's, pick your Roman, pick your Greek, pick your whatever god you'd like to pick. Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven, the true kingdom of heaven, 
is coming, is near. And if you remember his teaching, because I, I realize that this is the first time you've ever heard this passage or any of the other passages of the New Testament. If you follow Jesus' teaching, constantly what he says is the kingdom of God has come, the kingdom of God is with you, the kingdom of God is near, the kingdom of God is coming, rising, is in you. This is something that is not just around us, and is not just secular in our language, but is a spiritual reality that is lives within us and which we are part of, and which, although it's out there, it's getting bigger and fuller and more. So that's the message. He's here. He's behind us. <laughs> he's, he's around us. He's near us. He's in us. So that's the message. That's the kingdom of heaven. That's the message of the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes into Galilee. And what's the next thing he does? He enlists help. He enlists people to work with him in proclaiming this. Walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw his two brothers, Simon and Peter, and his brother Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net in the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, he says. I will send you out to fish for people. And once they left their net, and once they left their nets, he followed. So he says, Oi, you guys. Ah. <laughs> And they give it all up. They give up their their families, their livelihoods. They give up the immediate fishing that they're doing, and they come and join him. And he goes on and does it again with James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, preparing their nets. Jesus called them and immediately left the boat and their father and followed them. Now, there's a lot to be learned about calling and following in there, and I'm not really going to delve into that. We looked at it a little bit last week, and you can reflect on that. But it's worth noting that Jesus didn't go out and start his ministry by himself. The first step he took was to enlist others to assist him. So whenever you see Jesus at ministry, occasionally he's on his own. <coughs> he's suddenly uh, next to a well and nobody else is around or something of this sort. But most of the time, he is surrounded by people, some of whom are on the receiving end, and some of whom are <coughs> assisting him in some way or accompanying him in some way in this process. They are disciples. So it's another word for apprentices, if you will. So he's, he's being assisted by them, and he's assisting them to do the same kind of work which they have accepted. How often do we see ministries and work and goals achieved by someone who says, I can do this, and maybe I'm going to tell you what you should do. It is not a solo ministry, and it is not one in which a supervisor tells the others how to do it. Jesus invites them to join, and then to join in. As we, as we look through the year, through his ministry, and watch things, what you will see is that Jesus does it. He does it, whatever he's doing. He then does it with them. He then allows them to do it with him. He then sends them out to do it, and they come back and check in and, and, and ask questions, and, and then he leaves them to it. Then he goes off and gets crucified and disappears. Why does he need to do it with apprentices and disciples?
He does it because he knows that he's going to go away. He knows he's here only for a short period of time. And when he goes, if he hasn't impacted and enlisted people, all that's left is a rumor or a memory. But if he's actually trained up people to continue to work on it, and they train up people, and he set a pattern in their lives, then we end up in this room today. That's something to think about in our own ministries, but it's also worth knowing that God, as I said last week, every one of us is called by God to be in his service. Some of us recognize it, some of us refuse it, some of us refuse it for a while and then recognize it. Some of us recognize part of it and then more of it. Some of us recognize part of it and then less of it. And it's a process for us, but it is one in which every one of us is invited to become part of, part of the kingdom, part of the work of the kingdom, part of the message of the kingdom part of the reaching out to others with the kingdom. And we're seeing the beginning of that right here with the calling of these disciples. Okay, so what is this ministry? It tells us in here, he's, he's, he's enlisted a few people in it. He will continue in this model all the way through his ministry. And then it says, Jesus went throughout Galilee. So where'd he go? Everywhere in the area. Now, in the beginning, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. He teaches in the synagogues. So he goes a place like here, and he says, come in, and I will teach you. But then he goes out and he proclaims. Proclaiming is going out to where they are and telling them out there. So he goes into the fields and he goes and has dinner with people and he wanders into the marketplace and as he's going there, he talks to people along the roadside. So there's a teaching, proclaiming piece of it. There's information impartation. Yeah? But he doesn't just do that. Because he teaches, he preaches, he proclaims the good news of the kingdom, and he heals. And later on we'll see that healing is not just a physical correction of an imperfection. It is actually a healing of the whole person. So it includes a making people feel better about themselves. It involves forgiveness. It involves setting them on different paths. It involves providing the information, not just for its own sake, but for the sake of their ability to then enter into whatever it is. And we'll see a whole bunch of that uh, all the way along the line. So Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God is here, the kingdom of God is near, and then he demonstrates like this. I think, it doesn't tell us that, but I think he starts with healing because that's where you draw a crowd in those days. These days, we probably have a rock concert. You get a crowd. Or you probably have, I don't know, a political rally or something, or, or a, uh, um, where, a, a football game. <laughs> There would be Jesus at halftime. It's a little hard to figure it out, but, but he does what will draw a crowd because he wants to reach more, more people. In healing, that's something they didn't have much of in those days. Medicines were not so advanced, medical uh, care. Do you think the NHS is not up to snap? <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't so good in those days. <laughs> then you can go and look at the other last two verses to see just what else he did. <laughs> so the ministry was healing, loving, advising, forgiving, so and so and so and so. And he did it with them, he did it 
He did it to them, he did it with them, he let them do it, and then he left them doing it. And they did the same out through the whole spread of Christendom. That's what we're about. That's what this church is about. That's what Christ the King is about. And if you look at the vision statement for this church, it's about continuing in all sorts of ways. All of the stuff that Jesus did, Christians today are called to do. Now, you may not be called to stand up and open a Bible passage to the rest of us in the back of the service. You might be. Maybe not. You may or may not be called on to heal somebody. You may have never done that before. One of the great things about Jesus working with the disciples was they had never done that before. They didn't think they could do it. And they discovered by trying, you need courage them to do that, that they could multiply bread and wine and feed multitudes, that storms would go down, that people would get healed, all sorts of things would happen. We need as a church and as individuals in that church to think about this year, what is God calling us to do? Not just in broad pictures, not just out there in the universe, but also here now. How do we live our lives? How do we reach other people? How, do, how can we, with Jesus, alongside us, by his spirit, we've got everything he had now, do this. So I leave you with that as something to think and pray about. And to put that, just as we put passages in context of how they're written, to put that in the context of your life today and think through where it might go. Tiffany's a great time to do that. Amen. Amen.